Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking uh, very little about Docker itself, and more about where we're going to go uh, from here, I guess. Do all of you know what Docker is? Yes. Cool. Everyone's looking nodding that stage, so that's awesome. Um, so uh, those of you, um, some of you are familiar with the history, but Docker is <coughs> just over a year old. Um, I think it. I think it's. Uh, I think it's slightly younger than DigitalOcean, uh, but only just. Um, and it was open source in March last year, and our version one release was in the start, at the start of June. So uh, in less than a, in a year and a bit, uh, we've gone from um, uh, sort of a hacky prototype, you know, a language that most of us know very well, go, uh, into an active something we consider as reasonably production ready and solid. Um, as part of that process, we identified a whole lot of things uh, that really we we needed to do beyond Docker. So Docker very much handles the sort of compute side of things. And uh, uh, when we started to sit down and go, well, you know, we built this really cool container virtualization thing, and it does, you know, it builds containers and build images, and you can do all of this sort of stuff to, to sort of manage the basics of your build pipeline, we started to think about, well, what do you need to actually make this uh, fully fledged production tool? AK, okay, so what do we do now? Um, this is, uh, this is uh, a line Solomon uses all the time to me, which is like, which is generally speaking, as if we hadn't built anything over the last 12 months and we're just scratching the surface, um, which gives you an indication of uh, how Solomon's brain works. So he describes what we have as, as a blueprint. Um, it's sort of like a, a methodology with a bit of tooling around it that says, you know, in order to ship applications around and be portable, you know, you have containers, you have a workflow that Docker provides, you have a strong platform and a strong API. So, where do we go from here? Well, the next logical step is that, um, you know, the problem we were originally trying to solve was kind of the problem a little bit that has and the ice markers trying to solve, which is that it's kind of hard to get code off your desktop and stick it somewhere and run it. Like, there's lots of different solutions. You can go with stuff like Heroku and Cloud Foundry and OpenStack and Amazon. But all of them require sort of varying levels of complexity. And it's pretty hard to, if you've chosen Heroku, it's pretty hard to make a decision, go, I'm going to back out of that and go to Amazon. Or at least it's a non-trivial exercise. So we sat down and said, you know, there is actually a, uh, you know, there's actually a, a bigger problem here. And, and it's that, that in order for more complex applications, more co applications than just say one or two containers to be actually be managed, we need to have a whole bunch of tooling around that that makes that possible. So this is again time to upgrade the internet. Um, this is our very un, 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 uh, uh, it's our very uh, we'll describe it as modest claim. So we have the technology. Um, there's a bunch of stuff out there. Uh, people have demonstrated awesome stuff uh, with Docker and without. Uh, we have heaps of bandwidth. Storage is really easy. Compute. Uh, you get some sandboxing. Um, there's crypto tools out there. Compression. Uh, copy and write file systems. Packets and raft consensus. There's a whole bunch of these little things out there. Um, but all of them tend to be sort of pulled together in different ways. So a good example of this is uh, if you work at a really smart shop, uh, like stuff like Docker was not a surprise to you. Like if you work at Etsy, they've, they've been an LXC user for several years. You work at Google, which would be in containers a week. But Etsy, Google, Flickr, eBay, Facebook, all of the other places that were sort of heavy container shops, all had something in common. They had a bunch of really smart engineers who built standard interfaces for tools like LXC. And they put them together um, and they made them into work in their environment. If you talk to any of those engineers, and I was talking to about Facebook the other day, um, about like, why didn't you guys open source that? And he goes, well, hmm, well, it's kind of tricky and it's sort of tied to our environment and it's hard to use all this stuff. And I said, well, so there's no real API. And he goes, well, it's an API, but it's sort of a Facebook -y API. And I'm like, okay, all right. Um, and by that he means it's like that every one of the Facebook engineers recognise it. You have to sort of rejig it to actually make it work. So you've got all this cool technology. You don't have any standard interfaces. So Docker, um, one of the big things about Docker is we attempt to build standard interfaces. So the first thing we sat down with and said is, you know, let's stop using LXC. And there's a couple of reasons we did that. One of them is that LXC is, is um, uh, you know, very obviously very Linux centric, and occasionally a little bit not very backwards compatible, um, and a little bit unstable. Um, and we said to ourselves, you know, what what can we do about changing this? And what we came up with is a thing we called libcontainer. And we realised as part of that discussion that the value of Docker is not really the technology; it's getting people to agree on what you describe as a standard. Um, and I very much. Uh, 
I, I, I've worked in the Linux Unix world for 20 something odd years, and you can rarely find people who will agree about package formats and init systems and things like that. And we looked at that and said, how about we actually actually bypass a lot of this discussion, take this to the next level up, and actually try and have a conversation about standardizing <coughs> compute and portability things around compute. So we already have the packaging distribution, which is the container itself. Um, we have simple sandboxing, which is, uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, it's, uh, the, cat, the cat running around inside the thing, not causing any harm because it's safely inside a docking container. Not sure whether there was a whole Werner Heisenberg um, uncertainty principle thing at work here or not, but, um, uh, and I'm sure they let the cat out afterwards. Um, but we had this format we called libcontainer. And libcontainer essentially is what we replaced LXC with, it, and it's basically a standard interface to operating system sandboxing. And it combines all of the capabilities we use, namespaces and C groups, lots of the stuff. Um, and as part of the Docker 1.0 launch, we pulled it out of Docker itself, out of Docker Core, and we made it a separate project. And you can see it here. Um, we embed lib container inside so Docker, you still get it, but it's now a standalone project. And you're probably going, that's not very interesting, like container formats, like this is boring kernel stuff. But these are the people we've got to agree that this is a good idea. So Red Hat is contribu has contributed SC Linux support and systemd integration. So now uh, libcontainer, um, you can actually use libcontainer on its own natively out of the box as Red Hat um, with, a, with a, a bunch of tweaks. Uh, Google have recently joined. They're merging there. They have a format called let me, let me containerize this. Which I, <laughs> I get tongue tied every time I say, I don't know, there's some common LMTCP board paper. Um, so they're joining as core maintainers and they're going to actually standardize on libcontainer. <coughs> Those of you who work in service providers will be familiar with these guys. Pretty much anyone running a VPS environment is probably got OpenVZ running somewhere. They're contributing a C implementation, which will link to OpenVZ. Uh, the LXC and Ubuntu guys are also going to be providing a C group interface. So what we're attempting to do is essentially say, let's produce a standard that says, here we have containers. These are just the people I can talk about now. Um, hypothetically, there is a large software firm in Redmond um, that, that may be interested in contributing something like Hyper-V support. Hyper-V is kind of just like operating system virtualization, very easy to add to a little container format, uh, as is several other um, software companies who have a similar sort of thing, including uh, things like Solaris Zones, uh, BSD Jails, and similar sorts of things. Which means that we'll be able to say, it doesn't matter what the platform is, you get the same portability uh, from a container. Uh, your, your work, sorry? One of our Oracle Yeah, Solaris is uh, Oracle, obviously an Oracle product. We're having a conversation with them about, uh, so both Solaris and also, um, I always say this wrong, Luminos or whatever it's called, the, the, the open Solaris thingy. Um, uh, so yes, you can see the, the repo. If you are interested in this sort of technology, um, there's a great opportunity to, to get involved. One of the other things Docker provides is networking. But that kind of networking is really simple. Like it's, you have a single Docker host, the containers on that Docker host can talk to one another, but they can't talk to other Docker containers and other Docker hosts, which kind of limits the capability. So like, you can build multi-tier, multi-stack containers, but they have to live in one place. And that's kind of lame. Um, and we all know that our applications don't live in one place either. So we've open sourced another project called LibChan, um, which is a, a communication protocol for distributed systems. And essentially what it is, is it, it relies on it's very much like Go channels, for those who are familiar with it, over the network. It does simple message pass passing, does synchronization, passes everything around as raw sockets, and does nesting, so you can actually build things like nested channels of communication. So we're going to make this the backbone of the communication between, um, between Docker and other Docker hosts, and other, other bits of infrastructure as well. It's a really simple bit of technology. Um, it's very easy to write a libchain interface. It's like a, a you know, 40, 50 lines of code. Incredibly simple. Uh, it natively supports SPDY and TLS, web sockets, raw TCP, Unix sockets, and in-memory Go channels. So already out of the box, we're trying to take things a bit further and say technology is moving. We should actually think ahead of it instead of trying to support just support what's in the past. Um, it's secure by default, so it actually it, it, it defaults to a state of trying to use TLS. Um, so you can actually use it, you know, as as a communication layer. <coughs> And we're making our standard sort of communication layer for Docker. And all, all basically the internal components of Docker um, 
things like uh, in the current inter container communication, things like that, will, re will be replaced with this. Um, it's open source. You can go and have a look. You can use it. Um, it's very simple right now, but it's been grown upon all the time. So that's really kind of a building block. Again, not hugely exciting, which leads us into the piece that, that I'm actually kind of interested in. Because this is the part where we actually start to sort of put uh, all the, uh, um, our money where our mouth is. And that is that if you're trying to build things like multi-tenant, multi multi-site uh, applications, you really need to have some sort of sense of orchestration. And so what we've done is we've said, we've got a standard format, which is the Docker API. We're going to make the Docker API talk uh, across multiple Docker hosts. So you can have a Docker host in AWS, have a Docker host in your VMware cluster behind the firewall, and then not another Docker host at DigitalOcean. Um, and you're going to be able to ship containers around. And we don't really care what the shipping is. Not particularly fast. Um, uh, LibChan is going to be the layer of communication. Um, you can use, we're going to make this pluggable, so you can use whatever tools you like. Uh, for example, if you like Mesos, use Mesos. Have Mesos do all of the scheduling and shipping, move your containers around. Like Mesos says, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, I get cheap spot rates on Amazon, I'm going to move all my stuff to Amazon. Oop, it's the weekend, it's cheaper digital, I'm going to move it back there. Um, or GD, or CoreOS, or Fleet. Don't really care. I think there's some awesome tools and ecosystem being developed out there. Um, I, I, I love ecosystem competition orchestration tools. They've been one of those spaces where things have sucked for a very long time. So to have like four or five tools, you're just like, oh, this is awesome. Um, and then, or Console, or Helios, or New Relics, New Centurion. Again, the ecosystem. This is, most of these tools have appeared in the last six months, if not the last three months, giving an indication of where we might be 12 months time is, is a hugely interesting ecosystem. So, and I haven't got the lotion on now, whoops. <laughs> and he's gonna kill me, there we go. Um, so uh, we, have, we have a bunch of different fabrics you can deploy to, um, including things like DO, uh, pretty much anything that you can run a Docker host on now, we should be able to target. And then we're gonna provide an orchestration layer. And we call this orchestration layer LibSwarm. And I can't, again, this is one of those things that I, I pronounce funny, Americans apparently hear this as, but it's like a swarm of wasps, and everyone looks at me and goes, a what, a swarm? No, swarm, swarm, I'll, I'll try and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, and it's basically a very little simple toolkit. At the moment, it's a very simple toolkit, basically for composing network services. So what we're gonna, we're gonna produce is that, it's essentially a way of saying, here's a, here's a service, and here's a service, a bunch of capabilities and components about that service, uh, that I want to share with other, other services. Um, and it's a standard way to advertise that. So you can compose relatively complex architectures with simple building blocks. Uh, you can swap any service, like, you know, you don't like the authentication service you're using. Uh, and a good example here is you're an AWS shop and you're currently plugged into an AWS service like RDS. It's very easy to build a standard interface to RDS and then say, ah, oh, not like RDS anymore, I'd like to shift to something else. Uh, a native uh, MySQL database on my local environment, I'll flip the interface to say, point to the, the MySQL database. Obviously, early days, um, not quite as easy as that yet, say for a database, but it's very easy to swap in and out for a new resource. I can easily build an interface that talks to Amazon and EC2 and spins up an instance. If I don't like that anymore, I can, I can flip it and point it to the DO's API and spin up an instance there instead and migrate my workflow all completely transparent. Um, we have a built-in library of things. People are currently writing, uh, the AWS team, a bunch of other people are currently writing services. Um, yeah, so there's a Mesos client, Atomic and ED, Fleet ETCD, Orchard, Google Cloud, Rackspace Cloud, Tudum, Shipyard, there's a TLS tunnel adapter. Um, uh, IBM have a, uh, a, soft, a soft layer adapter. There's a bunch of other tooling coming. Essentially, we'll be allow you to say, um, uh, you know, I can have all of my, my Docker service communicate over this medium. At the moment, it's very simple, and it it's literally was open source two weeks ago. But if you have a look at, um, if you have a look at the repo, you've got to see what, what we're working on. And the one thing we guarantee is that LibSwarm will always work on Docker. So if you have LibSwarm in the middle there, um, then we will guarantee that, that LibSwarm will always allow you to communicate between a Docker host. Another Docker host. That's the repo there, uh, and you can have a, have a squeeze at that. Uh, as I said, it's very early days. We're only starting to see the <coughs> come out of the woodwork. 
but we expect to have some big product releases around this in the next couple of months. So those are the kind of the, the sort of building block pieces, and, 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 I, and I do apologize because they are very much building block pieces. For a lot of people, this is like, this is not exciting. He's talking about widgets. Um, I can't use a widget. Um, but we have some other things on the way that build on these widgets. So one of the problems a lot of people have is that when they run Docker images, they're worried about the fact that where did this Docker image come from? We have a little bit of transparency to that. Like you can see how a Docker image is built from the Docker file, and we have uh, automated builds that allow you to sort of link your Docker, the Docker Hub to GitHub and build things. But we're also going to add um, identity. So you can actually sign Docker images. So you've got to say, uh, either with an internal CA or a CA available to you, to be able to say, this Docker image belongs to me and my company, and I can guarantee that it's, it, it, it's produced by, say, the, t the, the, the production operations team, and they're going to ship that. And if, uh, if you imagine a lot of the people we, we uh, ship images with us, people like Red Hat, um, Oracle, and people like that, are very keen to be able to say, this Docker image is the Oracle MySQL Docker image, or this Docker image is the RHEL 7 image that comes from Red Hat. And you'd be able to call, but run back to the, the image and say, is this a valid image with a signed certificate? This can lead to a couple of other interesting things. The primary one being authorization. You do stuff like, I will only let my Docker hosts run a valid rel image. Um, for example, uh, you know, I'm, I'm entitled to 100 rel licenses and they all must come from the Red Hat image and that's all it can run on that particular machine. Or, um, this is the production Docker host, it'll only run images signed by the production studio, which means you can say, someone builds a stray image or, or you can't launch a container from that image. You will only be able to launch a container from an authorised. Um, and for a lot of people with big uh, environments, this is a really critical sort of step. So this is something we're working on right now and we should have some design stuff for this in public in the next month or so. Um, and uh, I already heard from several people, but I need it now. Um, <laughs> Come talk to us if you have a requirement for this. If, you, if your shop is actually interested in this as a concept, I'm happy to take design input and put you in touch with the team who's actually working on this. Um, that's probably the, the the next big things in the uh, uh, in the uh, in the yard there. I do like this kind of things. Um, but you'll see a bunch more things from us to expand the Docker Hub. Um, there's a bunch of services on that now. There'll be a bunch more things coming in Q3. Uh, in Q4, um, we will allow you to sort of run your own Docker Hub behind the firewall in sort of hybrid sort of mode. And Q1 next year, you'll be able to actually buy something that looks like the Docker Hub internally, um, which should be a pretty cool concept. Um, James, can you just expand on Docker Hub and what it does? Sure. So Docker Hub is, is a, sort of like a central repository for Docker images. So currently, we run Docker Hub in, in the cloud, and uh, it, it uh, provides a bunch of services like you can push to it and, and store your images there. Uh, you also have the concept of private repositories. You can actually store private images on the, on the hub currently, but you can't store them behind your firewall without, with, um, you know, without a little bit of fiddly stuff. So we actually make that available for those people that, will not want, that want to actually run all of that hosting. Uh, I guess you think about a bit like GitHub Enterprise, your Docker images, behind the firewall. Can't you just run your own registry? You can, but it's got no authentication. You can't search. It, 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 all it is is storage, simple storage, the current Docker registry. Docker Hub has a bunch of services built on top of that. Can you, can you make like an um, application on top of Docker Hub? Like, or, 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 can you make a manager or container? Yes, that's one of the things that, that um, sort of will be Docker 1.1 probably. Will we make Docker a bit more pluggable? So you can actually build stuff. Uh, so that sort of standard APIs, things like the Lutus Swarm stuff, the Lutus Swarm stuff, will all be built on sort of plug-in hooks built into the Docker. So if you want to do a variant or something like that that manages the container a particular way or does logging or hooks into Navios or whatever it happens to be, you should be relatively easy to build that. Questions, comments, board, senseless, what can you draw away? So, so general architecture question, how does Docker fit into the environment of uh, Cloud Foundry or OpenStack, uh, those, those kind of things? Sure, so um, uh, those who are familiar with Cloud Foundry, probably Warden is the most sort of similar sort of tool. IBM is in the process of rewriting Warden um, with a thing called Decker, which is a basically Docker. Um, and uh, so essentially you'll be able to use Cloud Foundry to launch Docker compute instances. 
the same thing exists for OpenStack. So you can use Docker in two ways in OpenStack. One is you can have a driver for Nova that launches Docker containers instead of virtual machines, or whatever it happens to be. And you can also use Docker with Heap, an OpenStack's orchestration tool, to actually launch containers and do orchestration and stuff like that. Sorry. Well, continuous um, delivery, is there a way? I know you could create a batch file to go and delete that and delete your you know, images of your Docker container. But is there, a, is there a way you could set your Docker container to be for a certain period of time? Uh, there is um, sort of two different ways. One is you can actually specify when you run a Docker container that it should only run and exist for the period of time the process inside it runs for. And then if it stops, when the, if that process <coughs> stops, it'll stop and delete the container. And that's the dash dash rm option. Um, there's also a, a, currently a pull request to update that option to say, uh, to update uh, Docker run to say, please run this container for, until the process stops running, or for five minutes, or for 10 minutes, or something like that. I don't, know. I don't quite get the use case, but, but okay. I think so, yeah, you have to have a look. I, I'm pretty sure I saw that swing by like a couple of days ago. If not, um, in the Docker dev channel, you're welcome to ping uh, Victor Vu, um, V I E U X is his IRC handle. V I E U X is his IRC handle, and he can probably answer questions. So, so, what's the roadmap for running Docker as, or running containers as a non root user? So, for example, user namespaces are obviously not quite mature in the kernel yet, but, uh, at least in the Linux kernel, I don't know about it. But, um, so given that, I don't want my container to have read access to my host, is there? So, um, I'll, I'll be really, 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 really blunt, because containers do not contain if you run root processes inside them. You are doing operating system level virtualization. If you have root processes inside a container, you may as well be just you punch holes in the wall, right? Um, so we recommend really strongly that you don't run things as root processes. The two things we are doing is that uh, we are going to mature user namespaces even if we do it ourselves, um, and they'll be implemented in Docker in one of the next couple of releases. Uh, we also recommend you run Docker with SE Linux or App Armor. Uh, if you're going to run stuff that, that sort of hat potentially has the, penetrate, the opportunity to penetrate outside that container. But most importantly, we say don't run root processes inside containers, not if you expect any sort of security. If you are going to do that, then you should treat that host as being a separate, either a separate trust zone, stick it in a DMZ, Assume that that host has the potential to be compromised. Sure. I don't think that's a bad practice generally. Running things as root is kind of a bad idea. It's um, a horrible idea. Yeah, but um, people still do it. Uh, if you insist on doing it, we, we take no warranties. But my default Docker does that. It doesn't protect me from myself. Um, uh, sudo, uh, Valen tools on Unix, it's like with great power comes great responsibility, right? Sure, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, but I mean, you have to actually t run something as a root process inside a Docker container. Docker does not, you know, uh, <coughs> uh, the, we're adding a warning for the privilege mode, which is the mode that sort of disables a bunch of that stuff, but also, yeah. you know, similar sort of things. You are doing something that we don't recommend. That's all we can do. Um, uh, there are simply not enough controls yet. I don't know. Google recently released this Kubernetes kind of thing. Kubernetes. Yes. Yeah. That. How does that relate to um, the Docker Swarm? Is sure. it all related? Uh, it is. Um, so where I mentioned before that there were sort of orchestration tools like Centurion and, and Helios and um, Console, that Kubernetes is another one of those. Okay. Um, uh, at the moment, it doesn't use this form as the back end, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty sure there was a meeting at Google yesterday that consisted of, we should have that as the back end. So, yeah. So, so everything that's been going on in Docker has been Linux-centric because it starts with Linux and all of that. In the future, what benefits could this have if you move and uh, was a, were able to handle Windows workloads? So I think that, like, I, I'm really kind of old, so I remember things like Solaris Zones, which actually have, you know, like, um, uh, actual security. Um, uh, my view of the world is that there's, there's a lot of customers for whom um, the thing they like about Docker is the workflow. So it's really about, um, they have trouble shipping code. Like it is a prolonged, some people might work in large organizations where it's a prolonged period of time between code gets written, code gets deployed. There's a bunch of things you have to jump through. Docker's workflow is designed to sort of streamline that. 
And to some extent, we don't really care under the covers what the platform you're streamlining on is. So if you thought about, say, like Hyper-V support, if the container has is a standard API, then it doesn't matter that it's a Windows box running Hyper-V underneath, but all it is is a compute thing shaped like a Docker container, and I should be able to actually sort of move my code around without me really caring what that is. And that also means you should be able to do multi-tenant, multi-operating system orchestration. So we're going to say, this piece of this application is a Windows box running on Hyper-V, this piece over here is a Solaris box running in zones, this piece over here is a, a Linux box running in a, in a lib container. Um, I, I don't really care because libswarm and the API is doing all of the communication. Can you write your own security stack within Docker? Yeah, the, one of the ideas behind the API portability stuff the, and the, the pluggability stuff will be that if you want to, um, we'll try and embed the hooks quite deeply if you want to do stuff like if somebody triggers this kernel capability, you do X, things like that. So I imagine that the yeah, tripwire sort of things will probably be the first thing people do, but, but um, uh, yeah, there's lots of other ideas. You know, if you want to also build your own Linux <coughs> container to do penetration testing, can you do it? Because I'm, I'm, what I do is, I took uh, Docker and I put a Kali Linux to do the penetration test. Yes. Um, you should be able to, as long as it's got a, 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 a Linux kernel recent enough to have the various capability. I don't, I'm, I'm not an operating person, I don't really care about what distro you choose. Like, uh, like if you're not an argument about whether Ubuntu is awesome, that's great. But all I care about is that, that it actually runs things and if it's got a 3.8 kernel or later, it work out of the box. Uh, I'm in an organization or company that's like at a small stage and Docker just seems really awesome and I should adopt it, but what kind of compromises or risks am I taking by adopting potentially like this whole platform? If you can think of any. I mean, you're, you're selling it obviously, so there might not be need to It's awesome, you should give me money right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think the, the obvious sort of I mean, like it's not a true virtual machine. Like it is, it is, it is a, it is a, it's an operating system virtualization. You, you um, uh, that may be a concern for you. Um, it, you know, our focus is really on that dev sort of golden motion, getting code out of developers' hands and as fast as the other stuff you can actually run it in. Um, and that starts with that sort of build test sort of stuff, and then moves into production. Um, I, I think that's probably the key thing. I would probably point out that that it. Um, I think it's all. Uh, the one the sort of upside to Docker, you know, I can sell a lot of things, but one thing I will say to people is that it does tend to force people to think about th their architecture a bit better. Docker's really designed to run like a, a single process or a single application in a container, so it forces you to think about things like services, and, and more people should build SOA and microservices architectures, because building monolithic architectures is stupid and it's a pain in the ass, because I've been the guy who gets to work up at three o'clock in the morning to debug a stupid application, um, and I don't want to do it anymore. Microservices is very simple. One service, it's either broken or it's not, and talks to another bunch of services, you can see where it's broken, which service it's not talking to. Um, that sort of stuff is awesome. Anything that encourages that sort of architecture, <coughs> yeah, you should build more of those. Um, lots of other things, happy to, I'm just james at docker.com, you can shoot me an email, I live locally, happy to swing by and sort of say, yeah, 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 this is a stupid idea, draw on whiteboards. <laughs> Um, I'm working with a project right now where I'm dealing with like, different containers where I'm using a, a, a YML file to download the containers. Some of the containers that I push on my hub Docker, it's easy for me to get them. Some, some of them, I don't get them where it doesn't even give me any reason why I'm not. Like, and when I'm reading the, where the file, the, 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 the temporary file that is created, it's just saying that off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Um, I would recommend logging a ticket or sending a note to the mail list. Um, and uh, if you, uh, I'm J A M T T U R zero one on GitHub. If you at, at me, I will have a ticket. J A M T U R zero one is my GitHub. You can, if you if you reference me in the ticket, I will have a look. Um, I get lots of tickets, but I will try and have a squeeze tomorrow. <coughs> Is there a story for Docker with Windows beyond Hyper-V? And I'm thinking more of like kernel containerization, drawbridge, things like that. Are you talking to Redmond about potentially tweaking the, the kernel itself to- I don't know Mark Rossovich or anybody like that and I would not be having a conversation with him. 
put it that way. Um, yeah, we're, we're those, it's, you know, we're having similar conversations with a bunch of people. It's hard for them to get their heads around the idea. Um, like traditional virtualization is a very strong force and people are like, that was not invented here. Um, but I think people are getting the idea, particularly developers are like, we will insist on having something that works better than something that takes five minutes. Yes, enough. Um, so we're having some of those conversations. Drawbridges, that might be a little bit further in the future, but um, simple sort of Windows support is something I would imagine will appear at the start of next year, maybe, depending how fast Redmond moves. So, and certainly Docker support in Azure, you can expect to see like now ish. But that would be high for me. That would be high for me, yeah. Awesome. What is your book coming out? Oh, damn. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so I'm writing a book about Docker, um, uh, dockerbook.com. Uh, it is 95% finished. I'm just doing proofreading at the moment. Um, it will be out before the end of the month. Uh, hang on. Is, what, are we still in June? <laughs> <laughs> before, the, the, before the end of July. That was awesome. um, yeah, I, I expect somewhere around the middle of July, assuming that uh, assuming my tech reviewers get back to me and, and I, I can fix all my spelling mistakes. <laughs> Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much.